Have you seen the movie Crash? It won Oscar for Best Picture in 2005. I remember that. All right, you remember that movie? All right, Matt Dillon, the police officer, giving a sobriety test to an African-American man, has the wife come out of the car to object, and Matt Dillon sexually molests her. Mm -hmm. Next day, he comes across a car that's overturned, the gas is spewing out, the flames are approaching. Matt Dillon climbs underneath the car, the driver's face is lifted, she screams because it's the same woman who he sexually fondled the night before. She screams, get out of here. So, Matt Dillon has an innate biological drive to preserve his life. His fellow police officers are saying, get out of there, it's going to go up in flames. He also has a drive to preserve his reputation and not be hauled into court by this woman for sexual molestation. Matt Dillon makes a decision. The decision Matt Dillon makes is to follow his conscience instead of his instinct. And his conscience informs him that it's important for him to save her life. Not, first of all, to save his own life and his own reputation. My instinct is, save my life. My conscience tells me, sacrifice your life if you can save that other person's life. I have to make a decision. Do I follow my instinct to save my life, or do I follow what I think I ought to do in sacrificing my life for the other person? It is my conscience that tells me whether my instinct is good or not. That is my experience. Where is justice? What is mercy? Where is the sacred and the holy? In this world full of choices, where is the truth in all the voices? Give me an answer. Don't waste my time Tell it to me straight The truth is getting hard to find I have objections to what I've learned I have questions and concerns Give me an answer And your conscience has a biological basis. That's sure, it has I've a biological basis. I got a brain, but I would argue that there's more to my conscience than just chemicals. Well, you would be arguing something that would have no factual evidence to back it up. Exactly, except my experience, and my experience no, is you have free not will. Experience what's going on inside your brain, sir. Every night, I can sit on the side of my bed and judge myself. Self critique. You don't think so? Not, you cannot sit on the side of your bed and say, I think that this is the, I am judging the circuitry in my brain and I am judging what neurons are firing on and off and how it's connected. Yeah, I can the promise brain, you I don't do that. Is, That's not what I do. <laughs> maybe someday, maybe someday we will have that ability and understanding of the brain, but right now the brain is still kind of a black box. Well, all right, fine. But I'm going to tell you what my experience is. My experience is, at night, I sit on the side of my bed and I evaluate myself. And I say, Cliff, when you said that today, that was good. When you said that, not so good. Don't repeat that. In other words, I have the ability of self-perception and judging myself. That clearly points me to the fact that there's more to me than just instinct. There's a me that can judge my decisions. That means I've got free will. That's what I define as free will. The That's me really that can judge myself. The, the, that sounds like a non sequitur. Like I, the, okay. the, the, the logical connection between free will and judging yourself is like kind of just a, you just pulled those two things out of thin air and decided that one way. No, I didn't together. pull them out of thin air. I shared with you a daily experience that I have. Okay. Self-judgment, self-critique, self-perception. You have a, a daily experience of creating non-sequiturs then, because okay, that's fine. what that is. Not only that, 
if this guy hauls back and hits him in the face, I'm going to look at him and say, you should not have hit him in the face. And if he looks me in the face and says, I'm sorry, my brain chemistry programmed me to hit him in the face, you actually I'm going to look him in the that. face and say, I don't agree with you. No. Your brain chemistry might influence you to hit him, but I'm convinced you have a will. You can That's believe. why I hold you responsible for hitting him in the face, because you didn't have to hit him. You chose to hit him. You can only make that statement if God tells you you can, because your morality rests on this God guy. And nope. what it actually rests nope, on is the Bible. No, my morality does not rest Bible, on the God guy. Which is, is actually what it rests on is the Bible. Nope, doesn't rest on the Bible. You, you could say that because those are your natural feelings about that, and I could say the exact same things for the exact same reasons. But you don't have an added moral sense because you read the Bible. If anything, reading the Bible confuses your natural moral sense. No, the because Bible God has commanded his some children of my desires. to murder women and children in the past. No, sir. He may do You're it being again. dishonest intellectually with no, that. No, no, no. Yes, you are. Yes, okay. yes, yes, you are. Because the, the Bible murder? is not saying that God delights in the death of children. I wasn't saying the Bible God says delighted. the it says the opposite. But the Bible also says that God judges, and at times when God judges in history, innocent people are swept along in that judgment. What swept along. What a like what a euphemism for widespread death. I mean, no, you've got to be more intellectually honest. Read the text in context and see the point history. is. Yeah, that's right. If you send a flood to judge people, there are going to oh, be man. some innocent people that are going to drown along with guilty people. And if you can't understand that, I don't know what to say. Uh, who here can understand that? I mean, this speaks for itself. Like, yeah, a flood is going to drown innocent people and wicked people both together. I mean, this makes God like the biggest mass murderer in history. No. Like, He's a judge, and he guarantees that evil maybe, loses. Maybe from his perspective, he's just sweeping people along, but I mean, these are people that yeah. are dying. Yes, they are. They're people that died, correct. Right. So, I mean, there's nothing more I can say. I, I think All this right. speaks for itself. But... I think so, too. Thank you. Have a good evening. I would like to ask you, as, a Ameri as an American Christian, do you feel victimized by the uh, by the secularism in our society? I mean, do, do you do you feel that secularists are trying to take away your religion? That so, as an example, um, not allowing public school dictated prayer in public schools. Do you feel that that is secularism taking away your right to believe and worship? No. No, I don't. <laughs> Actually, it's kind of surprising. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so you're so you're completely okay with not teaching um, uh, creationism in schools? Yeah. So. You believe that evolution is is an accurate theory? And I have the utmost respect for professors who teach evolution as a process. My problem is with the intellectual dishonesty of so many professors who teach evolution not as a process but as an origin. And they do that in the name of science. That is intellectually dishonest, I am convinced. Evolution as an origin is not science, it's philosophy. It's a philosophy of science. And I've had the privilege of debating several evolutionists who have pointed out very clearly that to try and use science to prove God is intellectually dishonest. And they've been equally honest to try and, and they've said, and to try and use science to disprove God is intellectually dishonest. I would say that you cannot compare faith, something that rests completely on a person's belief and not necessarily any need for evidence, you can't really compare that to a way of thinking that relies entirely on evidence. Faith is all about proving and this is right. Science is about disproving. You can never prove something in science. You can only disprove or support. I disagree. My brother is involved in genetic research to help the body take 
in the new liver and kidney without rejecting it. He's a transplant surgeon and he does research. I can promise you my brother is trying to find out how to genetically manipulate things so that the transplants that he makes will be accepted by the body. So I view science as a tremendous, fantastic area of knowledge where we're trying to discover how to solve problems. We're not just trying to negate things, we're trying to follow the evidence. Where does the evidence lead? Right, and you do that by systematically testing in, an, in, in a way that you can either support or disprove, but yes. can never prove. Yeah. Okay. So you can't compare faith and science. You can't use science to, to try to prove God, because how can you prove something with science? Science doesn't prove, it only supports or disproves. And God, by definition of faith, cannot be proven. It cannot be, it, you, you can say, oh, well. Interesting. You know, I, right. I, I feel God in me. Right. I feel a spiritual connection. I, I can, when I, when I read the Bible, I, I, I feel that connection with something greater than me. Right. Um, but those are only feelings. Okay. And, I would, I would. and science can show them in an MRI. We were kind of talking about feelings earlier and love. And you can see that in an MRI. So. Okay, I would express it differently. I would say there is evidence that God exists. Not scientific evidence, but philosophical, rational, reasoning evidence. Order and design demand an intelligent mind. In my observation of life, 100 times out of 100, when I see order and design, it points me to a designer. A beautiful piece of art demands an artist. A delicious meal demands a chef. A magnificent building demands an architect and a builder. When I stand at the foot of Mount Rushmore, if I say, wow, isn't it amazing the way the water dripped over the rock? Oh, there's George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, there's Teddy Rough Rider Roosevelt. That's ludicrous. The order and design of Mount Rushmore demands a sculpture. Mr. Borgland, I think, was his name. See, order and design, in my experience, demands an intelligent mind. If anybody tries to convince me that this sweater came about as a result of a hurricane passing through a cotton field, <laughs> I don't agree. I got a real problem with that. I would definitely agree that, uh, that you need a, uh, a designer to, cre to create something as simplistic as a material object like your sweater. I think that it takes the beauty and magnificence of evolution and time and trial and error and and species having mistakes in their DNA and being born and either being successful or unsuccessful. That is design. Evolution is design. It is a chaotic design and without without your uh, godly intelligence behind it, but it is nonetheless beautiful and can be shown through scientific exploration because you cannot you cannot deny all of the evidence supporting evolution, there has not been a piece of evidence disproving the theory. And as a process, but not as an origin. See, the question, is there an intelligent mind behind the process of evolution, is not a scientific question. It's a philosophical question. So what do you think? Is it more reasonable to believe that behind the amazing process of evolution, there's an intelligent mind? Or do you think it's more reasonable to believe behind the amazing process of evolution there's no intelligent mind, it's all just chance and fate? What's more reasonable? Reasonable or comforting? Reasonable and plausible. Reasonable, I think it is a lot more reasonable to think that things, to believe in a chaotic theory that things happen, instead of believing that there is this magical being in the sky that controls things. Because where did that magical being come from? Okay, that's a great question. Obviously, Albert Einstein thought at one time, along with Aristotle and others, that the universe was eternal. And therefore, there's no need for God, because the universe is eternal. The Big Bang Theory came along and showed, no, sorry, the universe is not eternal. The universe is about 15 billion years old. Einstein was sharp. Einstein understood, uh-oh, if this is true, that the universe is not eternal, it means there's got to be a God, a creator. Why? Why? because everything that has a beginning has a cause. If the universe has a beginning, then the universe has a cause. So is God eternal? Correct. 
God is an uncaused cause, without beginning, eternal. And that is by far the most reasonable answer to the question, what is eternal? Because the Big Bang shows us the universe is not eternal. It's about 15 billion years old. So the question is, who or what caused the universe? But who or what caused the thing that caused the universe? We're talking. All right. If there is a God, he's an uncaused cause. He's eternal. And right here, you talk about God as a male. Why? Who's to say that male that God has a gender? I, I, oh, that's very simple, man. God doesn't have big biceps and facial hair. When we say God is he, the only reason we say he is is because we don't have a personal neuter pronoun. The only neuter pronoun we have is it. And God is not an it. God is a personal being who loves. But you're right. So God is a person? Personal being. Personal being. Not, not body, torso, head, arms, legs. Personal being, a spiritual being, but not an it. God is not the force. God is a personal being who loves, who loves you. It's pretty good news, isn't it? Well, some people would disagree with you, but... On what basis? Who well, would, why would someone say, ah, oh, shoot, God loves me, I hate that? <laughs> no, I, I'm arguing that, that multiple people would, would disagree with you that God loves me. Good gracious, what kind of person would say God doesn't love you? Well, doesn't the Bible say that if someone doesn't believe in God and accept him into their heart, that they're going to eternal damnation? Yes. How can you, how can something love me and also want to give me pain? How can something love me conditionally? That's not love. Love is unconditional. And if God loves me, then he, she, it is not sending me to eternal damnation. All right, all you gotta do is think carefully. What does the Bible say about hell? What it says crystal clearly is, heaven is relationship with God together with God. Hell is separation from God. And because God is tolerant, and because God respects your free will, God refuses to force you to live life now with him and then haul you into heaven to spend eternity with him. Instead, he respects your free will. And if you choose to live your life separate from God, you have that right. He's tolerant, he respects your right, and he's not gonna force you to spend eternity with him in heaven. If but you wanna live your life separate from him, eternity you'll spend eternity hell? separate from him. That's hell. So hell isn't like Dante's Inferno? That's right. Dante okay. didn't know about hell. So. <laughs> Correct. So, so hell isn't, isn't this eternal pain and anguish, it's just me not being with God? Well, wait a second. You're a beautiful woman. You have gifts. You experience pleasure. You obviously have a brilliant mind. Those are all gifts from God. And when you're separated from God, you're separated from the one who gave you all those good gifts. It ain't going to be a party. Because you're separated from the one who has blessed you with all the tremendous gifts that you enjoy. Actually, I feel most separate from the beauty that is humanity when I'm in a church, when I'm surrounded by organized religion. But look at Jesus Christ, read the Gospels, and check out Christ. And don't allow the church to turn you off to Jesus, that'd be horrible. Excuse me, I, I shouldn't have said, I, I should not have only singled out organized religion. When I think about a being a father-like paternal being yes watching over me and loving me and and saying oh well i'll let you have your free will because i gave it to you um i don't feel connected i feel connected when i think about evolution i feel connected when i look at papua new guinea i feel connected when i look at the evolution from from mammals onto land and then mammals back into water because that's what that's what the uh that's what the conditions of the time provided for. And we have, we have, we have fossil evidence that, that whales, what we now have as, as aquatic mammals, whales, once lived on land. Do you think that that's, I mean, what, what are your thoughts on that? My thoughts are simple. If God used evolution to create, wonderful. But I can promise you, if you take God out of the equation of evolution, Social Darwinism and eugenics makes total logical sense. 
And man, I can promise you, there ain't one beautiful no. thing about social Darwinism or eugenics. No, I am and not social Darwinism that at all. and eugenics are totally no. logical following no. up on no. Darwinism if there is no God. No, okay, because that is, that is, once again, putting the power of evolution into some being, into some creator. But evolution it does- It is not. Social yes. Darwinism has nothing to do with the creator. Social Darwinism is humans taking evolution into their own hands. It's okay. No, it's not. Then what is eugenics? It's, eugenics is the logical consequence of understanding that evolution is survival of the fittest, evolution is an upward cycle, upward path, and let's help evolution. Let's not waste our natural resources, which are limited, on helping handicapped people, helping subhuman humans. Let's instead push for the survival of the fittest. Why should you waste your natural resources, which are very limited, on handicapped people? It's a waste of time. Instead, let's all evolve up the ladder, according to evolution. That is very logical. I'm not saying you have to go there. But that is very logical. Social Darwinism and eugenics make total sense if there is no God and we just are the result of the evolutionary cycle. God created you and me to be loved. That's why you have a need for love. That's why I have a need for love. About 30 years ago, it was my privilege to live for one week at Covenant House, a tremendous ministry to children who were pressed into child pornography and child prostitution. It was begun by a Franciscan priest, Father Bruce Ritter. Teenagers who were runaways, teenagers who had been pressed into child pornography and child prostitution in New York City would come to the door of Covenant House. They would be whisked in, the door would be shut so that the pimp could not catch them. There's a true story that comes out of Covenant House. There once was a young girl named Kathy who came for sanctuary, for protection. And the only thing she brought with her was a can, a small paint can. When she came to Covenant House, she made sure that she was never separated from that can. She would sit in the third floor dormitory room, in a rocking chair, going back and forth and back and forth, holding that can in her lap. Whenever she took a shower, the can would be on the floor, not three feet from her. And whenever she ate in the cafeteria, that can would be right in her lap as she would eat her food. One day, one of the Catholic sisters asked her, Kathy, what's in the can? Kathy said, Kathy said, it's my can. I prefer not to tell you. One of the Catholic sisters got very concerned. There were all types of alarms going off in her head as she watched this girl clutch this small aluminum paint can. So one day, this particular Catholic sister took Kathy to the cafeteria for lunch. After a bit of light conversation, the Catholic sister turned to Kathy and said, Now, Kathy, tell me, what's inside the can? And with tears coming down her cheeks, Kathy said, It's my mother. It's your mother, the Catholic sister asked. What are you talking about? Kathy said, I went to the funeral home when I found out that my mother had died. I asked for her ashes. You see, her name and the date of her birth and her death are on the can. It's my mother. It's her ashes. And then Kathy proceeded to tell the Catholic sister how two days after she was born, her mother had thrown her into a dumpster. The Catholic sister checked the police records, and sure enough, the New York City police had rescued Kathy from the garbage dump of a dumpster. She had grown up in foster homes, but when she was a teenager, she had wanted to visit her mother, to meet her mother. Fortunately, someone knew where her mother was. She went to the home, but her mother was not there. She was in the hospital. Kathy rushed to the hospital, and there her mother was dying of AIDS, of HIV. Kathy met her mother the last day before her mother died. And when she walked into that hospital room, her mother looked her in the face and said, Kathy, I love you. And Kathy sat in the cafeteria at Covenant House, repeating over and over to this Catholic sister, my mom said to me, I love you. My mom said to me, I love you. My mom said to me, I love you. You and I as human beings created in the likeness of God were created to love. God is love. That's why there's the Trinity. The Father loves the Son. The Son loves the Spirit. The Spirit loves the Father. Within the Godhead, 
There are three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who throughout all eternity have loved each other. God wasn't lonely, so He created you and me. God has lived in companionship, in relationship throughout eternity. There's one God, but He's in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And when He created you and me in His likeness, He created each one of us with His deep need, this deep longing to be loved. And the amazing message of Jesus Christ is that God loved the world, you and me, so much that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. And when you and I put our faith in Jesus Christ, He commands us to love one another. To love means to make an unconditional commitment to an imperfect person. And that's hard, isn't it? It's hard to love imperfect people. It's much easier to cross people off, to give them the cold shoulder, or to cut them off at the knees. Jesus Christ wants to make a deposit in your life. It's the deposit of His love. He waits for you to open up your life. He will not force His way in. He will not force you to respond to His love and to receive His love. He waits for you to open up your life, to ask Him to forgive you for not loving, to put your faith in Him, and to receive His love. And then He makes that great deposit in your life on a daily basis of loving you, caring about you, being with you. And then He gives us the strength to love others, to love one another, to make unconditional commitments to imperfect people. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the most exciting, the most fulfilling life possible. God bless you as you put your faith in Christ and allow Christ to meet that deep God-given need that you have to be loved. And then God bless you as you allow God, His love, to drive you out to make unconditional commitments to imperfect people. I'm the pastor of Grace Community Church. We meet every Sunday morning at 9.30 at Sachs Middle School in New Canaan, Connecticut. Take the Merritt Parkway to exit 37, go to the end of the ramp, take a left onto Route 124, go approximately one mile, and take a right into Sachs Middle School. I'd love to meet you and greet you this Sunday morning, 9.30. Won't you join us for that time? Have a great day. Where is justice? What is mercy? Where is the sacred and the holy? In this world full of choices, where is the truth in all the voices? Give me an answer. Don't waste my time.